Welcome everyone. I'm Noah Reed, Vice President of Sales and Marketing for the Dutch Test. And thank you all for joining us for this Dutch webinar featuring our very own Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jacqueline Smeaton. Today, Dr. Smeaton will be addressing fertility and how providers can better understand a patient's fertility through the Dutch test. Some studies show infertility affects one in eight couples and uncovering the root cause for a couple can be complex. Dr. Smeaton will share how the Dutch test can be a useful tool to explore several of the functional drivers for infertility. These include metabolic dysfunction, thyroid and HPA access function, oxidative stress, inflammation, and of course, hormone health. But first, let's dive into some news of the new Dutch educational resources that are now available. We are so excited to announce the new educational resources available exclusively to Dutch providers, the Mastering Functional Hormone Testing Course, and coming soon, the Dutch Interpretive Guide. Both resources are designed to help our providers build confidence using the Dutch test and implement the actionable results from the Dutch reports to treat their patients. If you are not already a Dutch provider, sign up is really easy and you need to become one today to have access to the functional hormone testing course. And once you're registered as a provider, you can sign up for the pre-orders of the Dutch interpretive guide or take advantage of our introductory offer of up to five kits at half off. Click the link in the chat to get started and one of our onboarding specialists will get in touch with you soon. Additionally, we have open pre-registration for a very exciting May webinar with Dr. Sarah Gottfried. She will discuss types of male and female sexual dysfunction, identify hormonal signatures of the most common types of sex sexual dysfunction, and review evidence-based uh, treatments that are currently available. Please click the link in the chat to pre-register for this webinar. Now, let me introduce today's speaker. Dr. Speaton is a naturopathic physician focused on infer infertility and reproductive health. In addition to her private practice, Hello Fertility, she is a prolific teacher in the field of reproductive endocrinology and hormones and has trained thousands of clinicians on her treatment methodology. Dr. Smeaton has extensive leadership experience in integrative medicine, including as president for the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, as an ambassador for the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, and a board member of the Integrative Health Policy Consortium. Thank you, Dr. Smeaton. We're ready when you are. Wonderful. Thank you, Noah. I'm so happy to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about my true love in fertility. Uh, and really, I've used the Dutch test as a customer for my fertility practice for as long as I've been in practice, as long as Dutch has been around. Um, and I really find it to be one of the most useful tools, not just to look at the menstrual cycle, but as you'll see throughout the presentation, the utility that it provides in other areas. So um, let's go ahead and just dive right in. There's a lot for us to cover. Now, before we talk about Dutch testing, what are we talking about when we're talking about infertility? Noah mentioned that infertility rates are on the rise. Um, they are you know, more common than breast cancer in here. I'm sure all of you in the room probably are have experienced infertility or know someone who has experienced infertility. It's really something that's touched all you know, all walks of life around the planet, unfortunately. So infertility is defined as absence of pregnancy or delivery of a live born child after one year of unprotected intercourse. Now, when it comes to evaluation, really there's a couple of times we think about starting a workup. First is any age when there's known or suspected barriers to pregnancy. So that might be things like family history or a history of relevant medical concerns like autoimmune disease like lupus, or um, you know, there's many other Turner syndrome, things like that. Um, also, after one year of timed intercourse for couples that are younger than 35, and after six months of timed intercourse for couples that are greater than or equal to the age of 35. However, I think that like socially, we define infertility as like the inability to get pregnant when you want to. And couples definitely come forward for evaluation and care, and sometimes even pre-screening and early preparation much sooner than that six months to one year timeline. And I think that's okay, um, particularly because it allows you the opportunity to institute a really good preconception program, um, which you really want to have around for three to four months of really healthy living and intentional preconception support prior to pregnancy. So don't be afraid to get started, at least with the basics, even sooner than these standards recommend, 
that's what we do as functional medicine providers is kind of take that stuff to the next level. Most patients will probably come to you having already done a standard evaluation, but just in case that hasn't been done, this is really what we routinely recommend straight out the gate for that initial evaluation. First, you want to document ovulation. So it might be patient history of regular menstrual cycles, or you can also do a mid-luteal progesterone level, and you want to see that serum level greater than five nanograms per mil. Um, you can also take a look at this on the Dutch test. You'd be able to confirm ovulation with progesterone level in the normal range, or through a cycle map, you would see that progesterone spike even more clearly. For a male partner, you want to do a standard semen analysis. Believe it or not, I see this missed all the time, even amongst conventional medical providers. It's really a shame because very often there is issues with both partners. And if you only work with the female partner and everything's perfect and they're still not getting pregnant, you have to kind of start at square one on a timeline when you start to work with the male partner. So do both for the initial evaluation. Next is an HFG or hysterosalpingiogram. This is where they inject a dye into the uterus and then they watch for that dye to spill out into the abdominal cavity. And that can show that the fallopian tubes are open or patent. Um, next is assessment of ovarian reserve. This is another really big one, particularly for women in their late thirties and older. There's a lot of options here. Generally, we look at cycle day three, FSH, estradiol, and then AMH, anti-mullerian hormone. That one actually doesn't have to be caught on day three, but we usually order them together. And then another hormone, inhibin, has some data around ovarian reserve, although it's not as commonly tested. And then if it's indicated by patient history, you might think about laparoscopy. Um, if the patient's had an abnormal pelvic exam, an abnormal HSG, or maybe they have something like a history of endometriosis, or they have all the signs and symptoms of endometriosis, and you want to get a more clear picture of what's happening. That would be something else that you could recommend right out the gate. But today, I don't want to talk about the standards and the basics, because I think that is the, the ice that you see, whereas the majority of infertility is that world underneath. And there's so much more to it that goes into helping couples conceive. So that's really where I want to focus today is that world underneath. So when you're evaluating patients with infertility, you need to do a thorough intake, review of systems, look at their health histories. And with this, I would take a broader, more functional medicine point of view. What are the signs they have of underlying physiological problems or patterns? What are things that might indicate issues with gut health? Do they have maldigestion, pain? gas and bloating, history of antibiotic use, et cetera? Do they have signs of chronic infections, um, trouble with detoxification or energy production? With energy production, we look at stress and adrenal and HPA axis function. We look at thyroid. We look at pancreas and blood sugar. Do they have signs of oxidative imbalances? This is things like allergies, eczema, skin inflammation, rashes, itching, other signs of histamine issues. What's their immune balance like? Do they have signs of inflammation, like frequent illness, autoimmunity for themselves or for their family? Um, so you want to kind of get a broader view. And then also looking at hormonal imbalance, you know, really great history of documenta documenting their cycle. I love when patients chart their cycles. There's lots of fancy tools that you can use now, but even just a basal body temp thermometer and tracking mucus can tell you a ton about what's happening with a woman's cycle. And then are there any kind of structural issues, signs of endometriosis or fibroids or blocked tubes? So really you wanna take a broader look than just sticking with that genitourinary piece. Now, I love this. This is, um, I didn't create this. This actually is from Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. It's on the, on the web. She has stuff on her website, but it's really an example of how you can organize symptoms into different functional categories. So, you know, they have, with IFM, they kind of have these functional medicine categories like fundamental lifestyle factors, defense and repair, assimilation, communication, energy, and then the mental, emotional, and spiritual realms. So as you're listening to a patient's story and you're going through their intake form, you can start to put things into different categories. So on the left-hand column where it says clinical assessment, these would be things that pop up that lead you to think there might be a problem in this category or this category. For example, um, dysbiosis is in a couple different categories. You can see that, that that would affect defense and repair, like inflammation or infection, 
but it also affects assimilation because if the gut is harmed, it would affect absorption. And as you go through a patient's entire health history, you can start to see where things are weighted. For example, this particular patient has a lot of symptoms that fall in that defense and repair category, kind of that immune inflammation and infection. So both on the symptom side, as well as with lab, and then you can think about the treatment approaches. So I don't give this to you because I think you need to use this model, but I do want you to think in this way when you're talking with patients and getting an intake to try to see what the patterns are that show what areas might be particularly difficult for them. So this was a paper from 2017 in OncoTarget, a very conventional journal about unexplained infertility. And I have to tell you, when I saw it, I was so excited because it is so functionally oriented. Now, if we start at the bottom of what leads to unexplained infertility, and I would argue actually just you could cross out unexplained and just say infertility in general. This is just kind of things that we don't commonly pick up on with routine testing, although as you'll see by the end of the presentation, functional testing can pick up on a lot of it. When we look at infertility, there's many pieces that have to come together for couples to get pregnant. So let's look up at that next level up. Cross out something being wrong, you need to look at egg quality or oocyte quality, sperm quality and motility, um, the embryo being received by the mother and implanting without any kind of issue. Um, you need the receptive endometrium and you need an immune system that can kind of leave it alone. And that um, you also need like good DNA, right? So what are the things that contribute to those factors or can harm them? We have hormonal imbalance, oxidative stress, and inflammation as key factors there. And when we look at what causes inflammation in the reproductive tract, there could be altered immune cell functions or inflammation, chronic inflammation going on. So this is a great picture of everything that needs to be in good balance in order to get pregnant. But let's take a look at some of these core functions, like the functional medicine perspective, and some of the things that we can look at that go deeper than conventional medicine and how that would impact a fertility workup. So first we have environmental pollutants, endocrine disruptors, heavy metal exposures, et cetera. Look at all the places that that really touches upon. Um, and you might have a different view where you think there's a more direct impact on other things I haven't even circled, but you'll get my point momentarily. When we look at gut health, you know, gut health has a direct impact on many of these as does stress and our adrenals. Um, we, we want, if we have HPA axis dysfunction, we can see impairment in a lot of these areas. Poor nutrition, additionally, and immune balance, autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, all of these things touch upon contributing factors to infertility. And so I want you to think about that because when, even when we look at conventional understanding of what leads to fertility versus infertility or subfertility, a lot of the functional approaches that we take, functional evaluation we have access to, can actually get to the root cause for many patients. And that's been my experience is we're able to really identify things that are contributing that hadn't been picked up on in another workup. So this is really a summary slide for you. I'm going to start with it. I've also put it in at the end for a little reminder for you. But when we look at those contributing factors to infertility. I've tried to put those on the left-hand side here for you, along with some of the signs and symptoms that you might expect to see paired with that problem. And then on the right-hand side, some of the key Dutch test analytes that you would look at in order to really help you evaluate. And you can see that there's a lot in here um, that can be tied to that workup. So let's go through this a little bit more in depth. So Let's start with hormonal balance. This is obviously the biggest area of strength for Dutch testing. Really, this is a hormone test. So of course it makes sense. It could be helpful for hormonal balance. And this is really important because proper cycle and adequate hormone levels are needed to mature an egg, to ovulate, and to support implantation and pregnancy. You need the right timing and the right level of progesterone, for example. So how can you assess this with Dutch? You can look at the sex hormones and their metabolites and other labs that you might think about for hormonal balance include the serum labs that I've previously mentioned. I also like to add um, DHEA sulfate, free and total testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin because the Dutch test when it comes to androgens and testosterone is really supportive 
of that, but you really, both of them can give you an even more complete picture. So where do you see that? You can see hormone balance in a couple different places in the Dutch test. The first place is on the summary page. This is the cover page, which I've zoomed in on a little bit, but you can see a summary of sex hormones at the top. This is for women. So you'd see estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone. For men, progesterone is not reported on this cover page, but you can see generally where the balance is for hormones. With cycling females, generally you wanna see progesterone a little bit higher than estradiol. You can see for this patient, it's representative of a bit of an estrogen dominance type of picture. The testosterone in this case, this patient had a genetic SNP that showed it to be very low, but you'd wanna see testosterone in the normal range as well because testosterone is necessary in order to produce good quality eggs. So you can see that on this summary page here. With estrogen, you know, if you see it high, remember that, first of all, this is a luteal phase measurement. It's the collection of the samples is between days 19 and 21. Um, so one, it can be normal. You know, I would ask if it's high, do they have signs and symptoms of high estrogen? Do they have heavy bleeding or cramping or fibroids or tender breasts? And if they do have those symptoms and estrogen is high, it could be an estrogen dominance picture that could be due to external exposures you know, the use of phthalates or BPA and food products, et cetera. They could have really high aromatase activity uh, or it could be poor detoxification. And a lot of things that can lead into that poor detoxification can be insulin resistance, obesity, inflammation, high levels of androgens, which could lead to higher conversion into estrogen from the aromatase enzyme, gut dysbiosis, you know, so much more. Now, if estrogen is low, I would oftentimes think about stress. And in fact, that's not a woo-woo thing. It's HPA axis dysfunction is really well known to lead to low output of reproductive hormones, LH, FSH, estrogen, progesterone. So um, stress is really the first thing that we think about. And I love that you get the HPA axis assessment on the Dutch um, Plus and the Dutch Complete because you can get a picture of that right away. Also thyroid dysfunction, high prolactin, low aromatase activity, um, low androgen levels can lead to low estrogen. And then also the cell health of the ovaries will make a difference too. That's, you know, that's where estrogen is converted. Um, so poor ovarian cell health or low ovarian blood flow can lead to low estrogen. And then last but not least, we can't forget perimenopause. Most of my patient population is at 35 to 45. So some of those women are going through a hormone fluctuation, the perimenopause. So it's something that we want to look out for. Um, if estrogen is low, also I would ask your patient if they're on anything with DIM, because DIM will lower total estrogen. So something to just double check for. And you're really most concerned when that low estrogen is paired with symptoms like vaginal dryness, hot flashes, low sex drive, mood changes, and insomnia, because that's really more of that like perimenopausal picture. Now you can also see estrogen, this is page three of the Dutch complete report, and you will see it also on page two in like a chart or table format. But I always like to look at these pages that kind of mimic the steroid pathway chart so you can see how things convert. So you have this estradiol, which I pulled from the um, summary page, page one, and then here you're looking at page three. So you can see all three forms of estrogen there. We'll talk about estrogen detoxification in a minute. Now, progesterone, that's the next hormone you want to take a look at. When it's high, oftentimes it's asymptomatic and normal, okay? So I, I wouldn't worry too much if progesterone is high. It'll also be associated with supplementation or pregnancy. Um, and I think some of the things that you might be worried about if it's high is that inflammation, obesity, and insulin resistance picture, and HPA axis dysfunction. While it's rare, it can be problematic. Now, the ideal mid-luteal progesterone is above 15. The data is pretty clear on this. I, you heard me mention before, above five, we know you've ovulated, but above 15 in that mid-luteal measurement has the best outcomes for pregnancy and for transfer success for patients in IVF. Now, the, interestingly, they studied women who are on progesterone supplementation, and they found that when progesterone goes above 41, mid-luteal, that actually can result in lower pregnancy rates. So be cautious. I see in our community, people use progesterone liberally for patients that are trying to conceive. 
there is a time where it's too high. So you really want to see patients get into that sweet spot between 15 and 41, and that's a mid-luteal serum measurement. And the Dutch test does report serum equivalents. So you can use the Dutch test to get an idea of that there. Now, if progesterone is low, that can be associated with anovulation, stress, perimenopause, PCOS, because women will go through cycles and won't ovulate, um, thyroid disorders, high prolactin, and many medications can impact progesterone too. And low progesterone, you'll often see paired with things like fatigue and insomnia, irritability, anxiety, and weight gain. Now, you sometimes will see low progesterone with high estrogen. Of course, it's all about the relative levels of those. So you might see things like PMS symptoms, heavy bleeding, or breast tenderness. So you do want to watch for progesterone to be in good, adequate levels. So progesterone, you can also see on page three of the Dutch Complete Report. Um, and page two shows them in that table format still. But I like to look at this level here. And what you would be looking at is this serum equivalent at the top of progesterone. And this is a weighted average of the two metabolites below, which is what get measured. And then you have um, five alpha and five beta metabolites of them. And so you can see how they are metabolizing. Generally, you know, you'll see them line up like this in many patients. Sometimes patients will have a preference of either beta or alpha metabolites. That's okay from a fertility perspective, but interestingly, um, the alpha pregnanodiol actually can cross the blood brain barrier and interact with GABA receptors. So it's really great for patients who you might want to use progesterone for them to like be more chill or relax at night. This, you might also see women in perimenopause that as their progesterone goes down, they start to experience symptoms of anxiety. This might be because they're producing less of that alpha metabolite. And so you can utilize progesterone to help them in that way. But if your patient favors the beta, five beta metabolites, you could give all the progesterone you want and you might not see a calming effect. So if you've ever seen that with patients, this might be part of the reason why, just as a little aside. Okay, testosterone. So you really want testosterone to also be in the sweet spot. Of course, when it's too high, like in patients with PCOS, um, you can have a lot of issues. You know, you end up not ovulating. That, that's a problem. Um, a lot of other things can lead to high testosterone in women, like low sex hormone binding globulin, low aromatase activity, so you're not converting it to estrogens, stress, obesity, blood sugar dysregulation, inflammation, and then also if you're supplementing with testosterone or DHEA, you might pick up on that through the testing. Okay? Um, I think most people know those high androgen symptoms here, acne, oily skin, changes in hair, changes in mood, et cetera. Testosterone can also be low in females, and this is really common in women as they get older as well. Testosterone naturally declines with age, but low testosterone can be a problem because testosterone is essential for ovarian health. Um, so some of the symptoms and things that you might see are in here if you want to read more about that. But you want testosterone to also be in the sweet spot. And while we are talking a lot about females here, it's important to note testosterone is also critical for males. You probably know this already for male fertility, you need testosterone to make sperm. So you want to make sure that testosterone is in the normal range for males also. Um, when it comes to high testosterone, one thing I want to just comment on when it comes to testosterone in males is testosterone supplementation, like testosterone replacement therapy, can cause or will cause low sperm production. Because when the body senses that there's enough testosterone around, there's a negative feedback loop causing the pituitary to secrete less LH and FSH. And so um, what ends up happening there is men make less sperm and then make less endogenous testosterone. So you can't use testosterone replacement therapy in men who are trying to conceive. Now you can view androgens again on page three of the Dutch report. This is the female version. The male version actually includes additional metabolites and all the metabolites can be viewed on page two in a table format. But what we typically look for here is that you would see, you know, you can look at DHEA sulfate here. You can see testosterone. Again, this very low level is representative of a patient with a UGT SNP. Um, so what happens with that is in about 10% of the population, but the testosterone doesn't get properly glucuronidated. So clinically, there's no out, you know, no difference. You wouldn't see that the testosterone is not low in serum, but because it doesn't get glucuronidated due to that genetic SNP, 
it doesn't spill out in urine the way it does for most people. So we just don't pick up on it. Um, you can see on the table form on page two, I didn't include that in here, but there are some markers that will look normal with a SNP. You can see these metabolites of androstenedione look normal. They're actually on the high end. And also there's a metabolite called epi testosterone, which would appear normal. So if you see that mismatch, like you have normal epi testosterone and low testosterone, that might clue you into the fact that it could be a genetic SNP. So you can always connect with our clinical team if you have questions about that. Okay, next I wanna talk about estrogen detox, another critical aspect of hormonal health to review. This is on that same page three, it's just below the estrogens. And so here you can see the different phases and steps. So you can really see phase one circled here. Um, and with phase one detoxification, you have the estrogen being converted um, by being hydroxylated into three different forms. Um, it undergoes conversion by CYP3A4 into 16 hydroxy estrogen, CYP1B1 into four hydroxy estrogen, that's the red arrow. And then the green pathway is um, facilitated by CYP1A1, and that becomes the two hydroxy estrogens. Now, generally, you want to see more toward the green pathway because that's our safest pathway. That intermediate is the most stable. The 4-OHE1 is actually the least stable, so that is the least preferred pathway. And the reason for that is it can become a quinone, which can be really reactive and actually cause damage to DNA. That's very relevant when it comes to fertility. And then lastly, that 16-OHE1, you can see in this patient that value is very high. The 16-OH is actually tends to be more proliferative. And interestingly, in this patient uh, that I pulled the report from, she had endometriosis. So interestingly, she was producing a lot of that 16-OHE1, um, which has been associated with endometriosis. When you go to the right-hand side, you can see a summary of phase one estrogen metabolites, like as ratios in a pie chart, along with the desired ranges. So you really want to see um, 60 to 80% of the 2-OH pathway, that preferred pathway. This patient just squeaked into the normal range. You want to see below 11% of the 4-OH. This patient was at 10. And then you want to see between 13 and 30%, and the patient was just squeaked in there at 27.6%. So that's phase one. You can read through this here. This is just kind of another written summary of what I've just covered. Um, but important to know that those phase one metabolites still bind to estrogen receptors, so they still have activity. And in order for that to happen properly, you need iron and you also need good liver function. And alcohol and a lot of medications get metabolized by those same pathways and can kind of tie that up. So if you have patients with phase one issues, first thing I would do is check on medications and alcohol use and really help improve the function of the liver. And again, I love to give these takeaway slides for you. So if you print out the slides, this is one that can be just a reminder for you of the things we talked about with phase one detoxification. Now, phase two of estrogen detox is on the bottom left-hand side of page three. And what you see here is that phase one metabolite, the 2-hydroxy E1, gets converted shifting left through methylation into the 2-methoxy E1. So this requires COM-T, um, and that's a methylation step. Now, that's oversimplified. There are other steps besides methylation. There's sulfation and glucuronidation in phase two, but we represent the methylation here so that you can see that. In this case, this is a great example of a patient who is a poor methylator. She's not going through phase two of estrogen detoxification very efficiently. You can see that a couple different ways. One is the direction that the arrows point on the dials. So you can see that she has relatively more 2-hydroxy E1 compared to 2-methoxy. You'd want to see these arrows pointed in the same direction or even have the 2-methoxy pointed a little bit more to the right, showing that it's very efficient. We also represent that for you here in the fan where you would want to see that red line like up and down in the fan dial or leaning towards the high activity. The problem if it is if it becomes low. So for this patient in particular, we needed to put her on some support for methylation using methyl donors like betaine and using magnesium and other nutrients that can help support methylation. So again, just a kind of summary here and really phase two, I love how Dr. Jones would always explain it that this is like tying the bow on the box 
so that your estrogen is now like packed up and ready to be uh, sent off to Santa land or whatever in the sleigh. Um, and then phase three is when it comes out of the cells and actually into and then out of the gut, hopefully out of. So the estrogen metabolites leave the liver through bile and they get excreted through feces and urine. And one thing that's important to know about phase three is that there is this enzyme in the gut called beta-glucuronidase. This is found in the tissues, but also made in the gut by microbiome imbalanced, you know, by some dysbiotic organisms. And when it's made in the gut, the estrogens end up getting recirculated rather than excreted. So Dr. Jones would say it's like cutting the ribbon on the box so that the estrogen can come back out, get absorbed rather than being sent on its way through stool. And that can increase the overall estrogen load. So again, just a nice summary slide for you. Um, I'm always asked, what can I do about this? So I have included some of my favorite therapeutics as well that you can think about just, for example, support phase one, support phase two, and support excretion into the gut. Okay, let's move on from hormones. And I know that's what Dutch is known for, and it's the reason why I order the test so much. But I really want to spend time today, because I think you probably know the hormone benefits, I want to spend some time talking about the other things that you can learn from the Dutch test when it comes to fertility. So the first thing I want to talk about is oxidative stress. Now, oxidative stress is one of the key drivers for cell damage in the body, period. But it's really, really relevant when it comes to egg and sperm health. I mean, the reason why men make millions and millions of sperm per ejaculate is that many of them die and are damaged um, by oxidative stress. And so we really want to keep that in balance. And there's a couple of great markers for oxidative stress on the OATS side. The, the last page of the report is the organic acid test or OATS, you're going to hear me say. And you can see them listed here as nutritional neurotransmitter. This is actually an old test, so it's missing some of them. Um, but you can pick up on the ones that are related to oxidative stress. So at the very bottom, you have 8-OHDG. Um, this is 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine, and it's my favorite measurement on the Dutch test by far. When oxidative stress goes up, there's more DNA damage. This gets spilled out into the urine. So you really want to make sure that it's at within those within range levels. And if you see it elevated, that's really concerning. Another couple include pyroglutamate. Sorry for the typo on that page. But pyroglutamate is a marker for glutathione. So if pyroglutamate is low or high, it can be indicative of a deficiency in glutathione. Now, glutathione is our body's most potent antioxidant. We make it from precursors like N-acetylcysteine. You can also supplement with it directly. So I like to see that within the normal range. And then another one that I look at is melatonin. This is a critical antioxidant for fertility. In this patient, it's really high because she's supplementing melatonin because we prescribe it a lot for cell health and egg quality. There's a ton of research on it. Um, just using that three milligram dose before bedtime can help to improve egg quality, um, particularly in older women. So you'd wanna check to make sure that their production isn't low and you could also supplement it. It isn't one that has a negative feedback loop. So supplementing melatonin won't cause you to produce less melatonin. So you can totally supplement it like an antioxidant without doing something like disrupting sleep. You just want to make sure that you still take it at 30 minutes before bedtime because it will make your patient sleepy. Okay, so other things that we look at here, um, the next one I want to talk about is inflammation and immune balance. So immune balance is really critical for fertility. And why is that? Inflammation and immune imbalance can affect hormone levels. It can affect your ability to detoxify it can affect the immune reaction. So we're not talking too much today about implantation, but the embryo is actually, or the blastocyst at that point is half mom's DNA, half dad's DNA. And so when that is implanted, it's actually foreign tissue. And so our bodies are made to recognize and fight foreign tissue and get rid of it. And there's a tolerance that has to occur within the mother to allow that blastocyst to implant and grow. And if there's overreactivity of the immune system or an imbalance there, that can lead to problems, that can lead to rejection of that or a failed implantation. So let's talk about how we can assess inflammation and immune balance. And before we talk about the Dutch, just a couple other labs that you might consider include HSCRP, which is high sensitivity C-reactive protein, sedimentation rate, 
You might screen for anti-nuclear antibodies and also total IgA can give you an idea of what's happening for that initial immune response. Now, this is a little bit more complex of a story, but there's a lot of common patterns that are seen when there's inflammation or chronic inflammation going on. So for example, you would see 5-alpha reductase upregulated. So you're gonna see more of those 5-alpha metabolites when it comes to like androgens or progesterone even. You might see aromatase upregulated. So that would be lower androgens, more estrogen dominance. You'd see DHEA sulfate lower compared to some of the metabolites. Um, you might see estrogen clearance pushing to 4-OH and 16-OH instead of the 2-OH pathway. You would see some changes of the HPA axis, like a higher cortisol metabolism rate, higher free cortisol level, or cortisol metabolism favoring THE when it's really chronic inflammation. And then you can also see some things on the OATS panel. You might see elevation of kynurinate, quinolinate, and 8-OHTG, um, low or high pyroglutamate, or elevated indican when the GI is involved. And that's because that indican can be a marker for dysbiosis in the gut. So you may not see all of these, but this is kind of my inflammation checklist when I'm looking at the Dutch test to see if I'm seeing like a couple of these hit upon, it makes me think, okay, this patient's got some underlying chronic inflammation going on. I should dig deeper to figure out what's happening here. And as far as what I might look at, I'd look at gut function, uh, maybe microbiome panel to see what's going on. Do they have some kind of dysbiosis? They might be carrying a low-grade infection like Epstein-Barr or uh, Borrelia, Lyme. You know, there's so many infections that can lead to chronic inflammation, even COVID. You know, we know COVID causes this massive inflammation, and there's data showing that there is a period of time post-COVID where inflammation is resolving, where patients experience temporary infertility. I saw this right away in my practice with men who had previously perfect semen analyses post-COVID infection had literally no sperm. They would have been like azospermic. So it does come back and recover, but it can have a pretty detrimental effect on fertility when there's a lot of inflammation or chronic infection going on. Next is toxic exposures and detoxification. So this is important because toxic exposures can impact fertility in a number of ways. It can affect cell health, both for sperm and egg, and it drives inflammation. It can change hormone levels, particularly pushing towards um, estrogen dominance, and it can have so many more reverberating effects. So I look for signs of inflammation and oxidative stress on the Dutch test that, again, lead me to say, why might this be happening? If I see high inflammation, high oxidative stress, and an estrogen dominance pattern, that would lead me to say, all right, maybe I need to do a little bit more of a workup on the toxin side. So you could consider labs like a full toxin panel if that's warranted, but I do want to leave you with just a couple of other like favorite kind of screening tools that are less expensive and a little bit more specific than those broad range kind of functional panels, which I do run sometimes. But the first thing I do, this actually comes from Joe Pizzorno's book called the, the Toxin Solution, which is a consumer facing book. It's awesome to teach patients and even clinicians about the impact of toxins. Like Joe Pizzorno was the founder of Bastier, where I went to school, brilliant clinician. I have learned so much from him. And really the latter part of his career has been totally dedicated to better understanding the impact of environmental toxicity on human health. And to give you some ideas, like most of the research is on things like cardiovascular disease and metabolic dysfunction, type two diabetes, et cetera. But exposure to toxins actually has a bigger impact than like what we eat, for example, when it comes to metabolic disease. I know that seems implausible, but it's a humongous impact. But he's done a lot of research and actually even with basic labs, so you can see a lot of these, their liver function tests, bilirubin, platelet counts, like things from CBC, a comprehensive metabolic panel and a couple other tests, you know, cholesterol screening, hemoglobin A1C. A lot of your patients probably have had this done already. You can put this into a scoring system to determine the likelihood of their toxin load. So you can, you basically add up their toxin scores for each of these, um, and then you can calculate based upon their total what their toxic load likely is. Um, and so if you do the screen tool and the patients come back highly toxic, then you might think about, 
doing a detox program or doing that additional screening for what toxins exactly are impacting them. Another easy one, and this is available online if you search for it, is IFM has a toxin exposure questionnaire. So I normally pair those labs plus this exposure questionnaire to determine what the likelihood is of toxic exposure being part of their root cause. And if it comes back high, then I'll have the patient invest in additional screening. I do wanna mention um, that you can see some patterns on the Dutch test when sulfation isn't happening properly. We talk about methylation and you can see methylation a little bit of estrogens as a metabolite, but sulfation is another area that's really critical for good detoxification of estrogen, but also of other compounds, of free radicals and reactive oxygen species, which are the underlying kind of problem factor with oxidative stress. So in order for sulfation to happen, you need a lot of sulfur containing amino acids, um, methionine and cysteine, okay? These are also required for CME production and glutathione production. So you can see signs of suboptimal sulfation on the Dutch test when you have low levels of DHEA sulfate relative to total DHEA. So again, you're looking at the direction those arrows are pointing in and are they the same or is the DHEA sulfate lower? You also might see elevations of the 16-OH metabolite of estrogen or elevated estriol relative to estrone and estradiol. And then lastly, low melatonin is another sign. So again, I like to share some of the patterns that we can see on the Dutch report that lead me to think about underlying factors that I need to address for the patient's health. This is relative for fertility, but of course, like we talked about toxicity affects so many areas of health that this is very relevant really across the board. Okay. Mitochondrial health and energy production. Mitochondria are critically important for healthy cells, including egg and sperm, and also early embryonic development is very energy intensive. So you wanna make sure that mitochondrial health is good, okay? In fact, I always learned, when we learned in school about mitochondria, we learned about the cardiovascular system. So years later, I was shocked as I started to do more in reproductive medicine to learn that the heart muscle is actually not rare mitochondria is the most concentrated. It's the testes and the ovaries, actually. That's how much energy is required in those organs. So you can take a look at mitochondrial health a little bit with the Dutch test by looking at ADOHDG, pyroglutamate, and remember that mitochondrial function and oxidative stress go hand in hand. And so if you see deficiencies in those areas, you might think about nutrient testing for CoQ10 and other nutrients that are necessary for good mitochondrial function. Okay, gut health as another underlying factor. This is really rising and it's been kind of my area of nerding out lately. I'm sure you have those areas too, but lately like reproductive microbiome and then the role of the gut microbiome on fertility have been just top of my mind. And I, you know, spend my Sundays like reading papers on this stuff. I'm sure we all have areas that kind of light us up like that. This is mine right now. But TI function, of course, contributes to inflammation and oxidative stress. It can also affect hormone levels. I talked about beta-glucuronidase earlier. And gut health affects the microbiome in the reproductive tract, which we know is linked with fertility outcomes as well. So the uterine microbiome, a lot of you probably haven't thought about that before. You might think the uterus is sterile. That's what I was taught. It's totally not. The vaginal microbiome, there's even a microbiome of seminal fluid and follicular fluid fallopian tube fluid, everything, okay? So there's a couple things you can look at to get a little snip bit picture into gut health. My favorite is Indican. This was added to the Dutch testing in 2022. And when Indican is high, that can be a marker of gut dysbiosis. Now it's not specific, like you can't say it's an infection with a specific microorganism, but you can see when elevated levels, I would generally run like a GI map or some kind of gut microbiome testing at that point to try to figure out what's going on. Also, you might indirectly see ties to gut health when estrogen levels are too high. So if there's estrogen dominance, I'm always looking for, are there signs and symptoms of gut problems? Is the indican high? That might be another time that I would do additional like broader GI panels or a microbiome assessment. And then just a couple of other considerations. Um, the microbiome is so important. I mentioned this is an area I'm totally nerding out about. We think about the gut microbiome, which I just talked about, 
um, and the reproductive microbiome, which I alluded to. So I'm doing a lot of vaginal swabs. And if you're in fertility, you might have started to hear about testing called the Emma Alice, which is actually done through an endometrial biopsy that gets sent away to look for both positive microbiome organisms, that's the Emma part, and infectious organisms, which is the Alice part. For example, we found that even very low grade infections with urea plasma have very significant impacts on transfer rates with IVF. So you can pick up on low grade infections that way. Of course, you have to be, it has to be within your scope to be able to sample the endometrium. So as an ND, it's not something that I do often, but I order it a lot for my patients um, for their reproductive endo or OBGYN to do. Okay. So find a good partner for that comprehensive analysis of the microbiome. And then the last piece is the structural evaluation. So Dutch obviously doesn't evaluate the structure of the reproductive system, but you want to make sure you're screening for endometriosis and fibroids or blocked fallopian tubes, et cetera. And that might require additional workup, ultrasound, HSG, laparoscopy. So I really recommend also that you build great relationships with the reproductive endos and OBGYNs in your area because they can serve as a great source for referral, even if it's just for those procedures, really to help support your patient in getting a comprehensive workup. So just in summary, when you're looking at the test, you want to take a look. This is that summary page um, at page one where you can see the sex hormones from an overview. You're going to deep dive more on page three of the report. You also on this page can see those adrenal hormones. Um, so we didn't talk about that today, but that's a whole nother area. Actually, last month we covered that in our webinar. And so I would recommend that you spend the time to listen to that because it's so relevant for female reproductive health as well. And we just don't have time to get into that piece of it today since we covered it last month. Um, but you wanna take a look at the adrenal hormones as well. And then when you're looking at page three, you can again get so much information on reproductive hormones. And then finally, on the last page of the report, making sure that you spend some time looking through those organic acids, which can give you hints in just so many of those underlying factors that lead to challenges with fertility. And lastly, I want to just give an example of um, cycle map, which I do as well in my practice. This was a patient where we had done serum labs on cycle day three and cycle day 21 for her, and everything looked really good. In fact, the estradiol looked like kind of high even on the serum labs. And so we thought she had high levels of estrogen, and I put her on things like DIM and stuff like that to try to bring that down. But then when we ran Dutch testing, I ran a Dutch plus the cycle map, Dutch plus plus a cycle map. Um, what's interesting is when you look at cycle day three, you have estradiol in the normal range, but then like the rest of the cycle, it's pretty much low. You know, her estrogen overall is extremely low compared to where it should be. And then similarly, she ovulated really early and we were able to pick up on that on the Dutch cycle map. So I really use this as well when I have those pictures where like their hormones just aren't making sense from the spot testing. Because with serum, you only can get a snapshot. It's one day. And even within a day, hormones fluctuate significantly. You know, testosterone, I think, like goes undergo cycles like every 45 minutes or something. It's frequent. So when you're only getting one time point, it's like literally a snapshot in time. Where I like the cycle map because using urine, you're getting a longer time point because that urine takes a longer time to build up. So you're getting the metabolites over the course of hours rather than just a moment in the serum. And also you get multiple time points throughout the cycle. So you can see how it charts out like you can see here. So just want to put a plug in that if you haven't run a cycle map before, that can be helpful for patients with any kind of cycle imbalance or fertility challenges too. So thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but I do just want to reiterate what Noah shared at the beginning that we are offering for new providers. You can get 50% off up to five testing kits. So you can choose the type of kits you want. You get that discount. It gives you the chance to try them on yourself, try them on your partner, on your patients. Um, and it's a really nice way to get started with Dutch testing. As Noah mentioned, we have so many resources if you want to learn more about how to really interpret the Dutch test with expertise. And the course he referred to, which launched 
about two weeks ago um, is amazing. It's, I can't believe it's free, to be honest, because it's like eight hours. You can go through it at your own pace and it's soup to nuts. Like if you want the expertise that our doctors have on the team, you can watch this course. You're going to learn so much about hormones and about the Dutch test. It's awesome. Um, there are some additional just benefits to the Dutch test. Super easy at home collection with urine and saliva. If you've ever done saliva testing where you have to spit in the tube, you know that that can be really challenging. Ours doesn't use that. We have validated a really easy salivary collection. You get really comprehensive reporting results. We'll even drop ship to your patient's door so you don't have to handle the kits. The turnaround time for the labs is consistently excellent. And then we give you a lot of support. You have the video tutorials course, the interpretive guide is coming soon. That's like a hundred and you know, something pages. I, I'm lucky enough here. I can kind of give you the, the treat that I got the print copy. Um, it's amazing. It's basically a consult in a book, um, but then you do have access to our team of doctors to help you as you're interpreting tests and coming up to speed. Um, so really excited. As Noah mentioned, you can click the link in the chat if you're interested in becoming a provider. Yes, thank you so much for that wonderful webinar, Dr. Smeaton. With the time we have left, we do have a few questions that we're going to try to jump to. Uh, so we'll start with some of the uh, the questions that we had in the chat. Um, Great. Which company do you recommend for sperm testing? Uh, well, normally I have my patient go to their local reproductive endocrinology clinic. So um, most hospitals offer semen analysis. The challenge is that not all of them do the best type of that. And of course, with labs, there's so many different methods and you want a lab that's using the best method, which is called a Kruger method or Kruger morphology. So you could call the hospital to see it basically, the morphology level, instead of 40% being normal, 4% is normal. It's like the checklist that sperm have to pass, like are the criteria they have to meet to pass is a lot higher. The bar is a lot higher, but it's a lot more specific and sensitive. Um, most reproductive endocrinology clinics do that. Now, if your patient is paying cash, going direct, there is a company that I do refer patients to. Can I share that stuff here? Any problem sure. with that? Okay. Um, it's called Legacy. So their website, I think is Give Legacy or Get Legacy. I think it's GiveLegacy.com. It's a mail order. So they send a sample collection to the patient. They collect it home and mail it back. And they do routine semen analysis. And they also do what's called DNA fragmentation which is a measure of like what percentage of sperm have healthy DNA inside of them. And that has risen as another really great measure for sperm. So that's another option. It's like, I think about $400 to pay out of pocket um, versus going through insurance with a reproductive endo. Even your OBGYN could order it from a reproductive endo and get it insurance covered probably. Speaking of genetics, do you find it important to check MTHFR in fertility cases? Yes, definitely it can be helpful, particularly with recurrent losses. That's where we really think about um, MTHFR. I would just say like it's not the whole picture. And I think there's been overemphasis on that one genetic SNP when really you're looking at like overall methylation. So I don't test it on everyone because it can be expensive to test and the therapeutics for the most part, the majority of patients' needs are met through like good preconception care, a good prenatal with methylated bees, for example. They might need additional support, SAMe, betaine, things like that. Um, but I do think it's really valuable. I just, you always have to weigh, with all the tests we want to run, you have to weigh the patient's, you know, ability to absorb the cost of it and the priority of labs. But it is on the list of really great labs to consider. Couple questions around melatonin and egg quality. So I'm asking if too much is is bad, or how would you supplement melatonin during uh, the fertility process? So most of the studies on melatonin for fertility and for egg quality use a three milligram dose of melatonin. So I haven't seen a lot of studies that go to that like 20 milligram, 50 milligram dosing, but we do see those studies in cancer where we do see that it improves cell health along cancer cell lines. So I would say that that's suggestive that higher doses could be beneficial, but the data, the majority of data on melatonin is at three milligrams. All right, the last softball question then we've got a, a doozy for you to finish. Uh, how do you treat a patient with high 16 OH and high 4 OH? 
but low to OH, does it say? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I would be thinking about utilizing your broad range of nutrients that really can support proper phase one. So I love self morphine you know, I love the broccoli sprouts and all of those nice nutrients that can kind of push it that way. The other thing that you can think about is if estrogen, total estrogen levels are high, you could add DIM, but that helps more with overall lowering those values. It would also lower the two hydroxy. So you're think if the estrogen levels are normal, I would not think about DIM. So you'd have to look at it on a patient by patient basis. Um, but that's probably the biggest recommendation that I would make. Wonderful. All right. Here's uh, here's one that might take a little bit more explanation. Uh, All right. Sorry for the rabbit hole, if, uh, if if it is one. Did you say 16-OH-E1 can be associated with endometriosis, and how high does 16-OH-E1 need to be in order to raise a concern? That's a great question. So, yes, I did say that, and the data is not conclusive generally. So, some studies show that elevation of 4, or the ratio of 4 and 16, are associated. So, I would say we don't have a clear answer. Although we do know that that proliferative 16-OH, and it makes sense that the 4-OH is also involved because of the cellular damage and those quinones like being more highly reactive and more oxidative stress and inflammation. But as far as like what absolute number you would be concerned, I have not seen that information, especially when we're looking at urine metabolites. Like there's just not as much published, you know, in general on urine as there is on serum. So Hopefully someday we'll get a better sense of that. But what I tend to look at on the testing is ratios. So if you're seeing the ratios of 16 going outside of that normal range or of 4 and 16 outside of that normal range, then I would definitely be thinking about it, especially if my patient is reporting signs and symptoms of it, like pain, heavy bleeding. You know, I would always start with the patient and use the labs to inform their care versus starting with the labs, you know, irregardless of the patient's presentation. How'd I do? You did awesome. I, right. I, I, I'm, I figured that was going to be a longer answer. Uh, so that's the one we'll, we'll close with today. Thank you all again for joining us today. Check your inboxes tomorrow for a link to the webinar recording and download the slides. It will come in your email tomorrow. Additionally, please visit the Become a Provider tab at dutchtest.com and complete the steps to become a provider if you have not already done so. All Dutch providers have access to the new educational resources that were mentioned today. And don't forget to click the link in the chat to pre-register for our May webinar featuring Dr. Sarah Godfried. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.